Question 33 is similar to a problem from earlier in the review sheet. It's again getting a percent composition and using that to determine how much of a particular element is in that compound. So for the SNO2, first thing we're going to do is get the molar mass. So it's going to be the mass of tin, which is 118.71 plus 2 times the mass of oxygen. And I get 150.71. Those values are from the periodic table. My percent tin is going to be the mass of tin divided by the total mass times 100. And I get 78.767%. Now, if I multiply that times 125 grams, I will determine how much tin is in the SNO2. Then I get 98.5 grams. Question 34, we're looking at successive ionization energies. So the first ionization energy is the energy needed to remove the first electron. Second ionization energy is energy to remove the second, et cetera. Now there's a jump in ionization energy values. There's an exponential jump once an element has obtained the electron configuration of a noble gas. So if we look at our electron configurations, magnesium is neon 3s2, aluminum is neon 3s2, 3p1, and silicon is neon 3s2, 3p2. If magnesium loses two electrons, so if it loses these two electrons right here, it becomes just like a noble gas. It becomes just like neon, which means the third ionization energy is going to be ridiculously high. So for magnesium, the third ionization energy is much larger than the second because once it loses two, it becomes just like neon. Aluminum, it would want to lose three. Its fourth would be really high. Silicon potentially would want to lose four, and its fifth would be really high. All right, protons, neutrons, electrons in an isotope of carbon with two more neutrons than carbon-12. Remember, isotopes are atoms of the same element with different numbers of neutrons. So carbon is going to have six protons regardless of whether or not it's an isotope. Six electrons because it's neutral. If it's carbon-12, it means its mass number is 12. So 12 minus 6 means six neutrons, but it's the isotope that has two more. So it's going to be eight neutrons, six protons, six electrons. Now, element that is more likely to gain electrons. So you have to look at electron configuration. So rubidium has ends with S1. Strontium ends with S2. Strontium is not going to want to gain any more electrons because it would have to fill its second, it would have to bump into the next energy level. So therefore, rubidium is going to be more likely to gain an electron. Now, B, aluminum and gallium. Aluminum is above gallium on the periodic table, which means it's smaller. So if it's smaller, those outermost electrons can get closer to the nucleus and feel the pull of the nucleus. So therefore, aluminum, it's going to be easier for aluminum to gain electrons. Iodine or argon. Argon's a noble gas. It is not going to want to gain electrons at all. Iodine ends with P5 because it's in group 17. Therefore, iodine will gain one electron and become just like a noble gas. Question 37 involves a hydrate. So when we have something that's written like this, when I have that little dot, it means that the ionic crystal of magnesium sulfate has incorporated water into its structure. It is a pure substance because it's a set ratio. Um, but it's not chemically combined, it's physically combined. When you're doing a molar mass for this, you need to incorporate the magnesium, the sulfate, and seven waters. And that would be the molar mass of the whole thing. Now, if I want to know how many moles of water there are, I start with 72.4 grams of the magnesium sulfate. And then I multiply times one mole over the molar mass. And the molar mass, I need to incorporate the water. 
So it's 246.47 grams. So you do one magnesium, one sulfate, four oxygens, 14 hydrogens, seven oxygens. Now this is one mole of MgSO4, 7H2O. Now if I want to know how many moles of water, this seven gives me my mole ratio. There's seven moles of water per one mole of this whole thing. So one mole of the hydrate has seven moles of water in it. Cancel my units, and I get 2.06 moles of water. 38 and 39 have to do with molarity and molality. Now you need to know that molality is little m, and that is moles of solute per kilogram solvent. Molarity is capital M, I'm going to write that up top, and that is moles of solute per liter of solution. So it's really just a matter of recognizing what the solute, the solvent, and the solution are and putting them in the proper unit. So for 38, we have 34.7 grams of sucrose dissolved in 100 grams of water. Sucrose is the solute, water is the solvent. So I need to convert 34.7 grams to moles. So one mole of sucrose has a molar mass of 342.30, and I get 0.1014 moles. Now I can plug this into my molarity formula, 0.1014 moles. And it, I have 100 uh, grams. Convert that to kilograms by dividing by 1,000. Make sure you know your prefixes. And I get 1.01 molal for my concentration. 39 is molarity by dilution. So if you are given two molarities, one volume, or two volumes, one molarity, you're going to use M1, V1 equals M2, V2. And you don't even have to put this into liters. You can leave it in milliliters because the conversion factor would cancel out. So what we have is we have 12 molar. I want to know what volume that is. I'm going to try and make a three molar solution and 500 milliliters. So multiply three times 500, divide by 12. I would need 125 milliliters of the 12 molar HCl.